Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. This is the Rock and Roll Spot coming at you with the weekly TV roundup. This week, covering both last week's edition and this week's, as circumstances got out of the way, got, got out of control last week, I was unable to post. So, anyways, since we're doing, since we are doubling up, um, what, the way we'll be doing it this week is to have both the episode that would have been covered last week followed by the episode covered this week of each series, as opposed to here's last week's, here's this week's. Anywho, that being said, let's get started. We'll start off with Arrow, Season 3, Episode 2. Uh, begins with Team Arrow discovering Sarah's death as Laurel brings her body to the club. Uh, in a flashback, Waller asks Ollie, or, well, tells Walt, Ollie he wants her, she wants him as an uh, operative of hers with Argus. His first target in Hong Kong is his best friend, Tommy Merlin. Uh... Back in the present, Laurel vows to help catch Sarah's killer, uh, and all the investigates the scene of the of the murder itself. Detective well, Captain Lance tells Ollie of the, another victim of Sarah's killer, as or, well potentially Sarah's killer, as yet another is claimed. Ray Palmer further tries to court Felicity to work for him, and at first rather unsuccessfully. Uh, Ollie tracks down leads, and Diggle finds a po possible name, Komodo. Ollie and Komodo have a bit of a, of, a, of a duel, which Komodo wins. Laurel interrogates Komodo's target in the hospital while Felicity and Ollie try to link the victims. During the interrogation, Laurel finds a link between the, th between the victims just before Komodo kills the third, be kills the th third victim. Roy gives Ollie the note that Thea left for him when she left Starling City. Uh, Ollie first goes to save Komodo's next target at Ray, at Ray Palmer's benefit. Um, a fight breaks up. A fight happens between Ollie and Roy and Komodo. Uh, eventually Roy is uh, becomes more between Ollie and Komodo. Uh, however, once Ollie, once Ollie defeats Komodo, uh, he denies it any involvement in Sarah's death, and in fact, Ollie has to stop Laurel from shooting him. Uh, Komodo's denial of involvement checks out. Um, Team Arrow buries Sarah in her grave from the shipwreck. Diggle informs uh, Laurel that his daughter's middle name is Sarah, after her sister. In flashback, Ollie has Tommy kidnapped and convinces him that Ollie is dead. And manages to convince him that Ollie is, well, dead. Um, Ollie decides it's time to bring Thea home. Felicity accepts Ray Palmer's job offer. And Thea is shown training in Corto Maltese as, and has managed to impress Malcolm Merlin, whom she acknowledges as dad. Now, so a quick thing. I ha So, us. Uh, suspect list in Sarah's murder. Uh, I initially had three suspects, but last the more recent episode that I most recent episode that I watched kinda knocked the third suspect out. First off, Malcolm Merlin. His motive? Well, she did sick the League of Assassins on him a little bit last season. Um, so he was probably a little bit bitter. Also, it's someone she knows, so it it works out there. And finally Rachel Gould. One, Raish is the big bad for the season. So to have him be the person who did the first huge thing in the season, okay, all right, it, it, it makes some sense. Also, it could be punishment for her potentially leaving, abandoning, uh, abandoning the League of Assassins once again. All right, moving on to season to episode three of season three of Arrow, which aired last week. Um, Ollie managed to find out where Thea is, Corto Maltese, as mentioned just a little bit ago, and he, Roy, and Diggle prepare to leave for Corto Maltese. Diggle is, a t is going along at, at Lila's behest to check on, on an Argus agent named Mark Shaw, who has gone dark. Um, Laurel goes to question a boxing instructor named Ted Grant about uh, providing an alibi for one of his students, a young man named Tom Bronson. Um, he refuses to incriminate Bronson, but gives 
Laura a flyer for Grant's fighting classes. Uh, in Corto Maltese, Ollie, Roy, and Diggle arrive. Ollie goes off to find Thea first while Roy and Diggle get them settle themselves into their hotel. And Thea tells Ollie she's never returned to Starling City. Ollie managed to find her work, working at a cafe. Um, and while, when he arrives at the place she's staying to find and asks about her, we find out that Malcolm Merlin is watching with an arrow already ready to put a, uh, an arrow through Ollie. Um, at Queen Consolidated, Felicity is getting a very nice office, as well as a damaged hard drive from Applied Sciences. Uh, Diggle catches up with Shaw, who informs him that an Argus hard drive has been stolen, and that include the, this hard drive, including soft targets, spouses and chil spouses, children, so on and so forth, of agent, field agents. However, this proves to be somewhat of a ruse, as in all actuality, Shaw is attempting to sell the hard drive, and needed actually a security decoder to unlock it, which Diggle provided him. Uh, Back in Starling City, Laurel, with some help and Felicity, goes after the abusive boyfriend of a fellow AA member and gets herself beaten up for, for her troubles. She later tells Ollie that she will let her tell Ollie that she actually felt good taking the guy on, even if she lost. Back in Corto Maltese, Ollie and Theo talk, Thea talk again. Ollie tells her the truth about their about Robert Queen's death before going after Shaw with Diggle and Roy. Uh, Thea op ends up deciding to go home, or go back to Strong City with Malcolm's blessing. This was, of course, following a rather awesome sword fight between the two. It's also believed that uh, Merlin let her win. Um, Laurel decides to sign up for fighting classes from Ted Grant. Felicity fixes the hard drive, manages to, manages to fix the hard drive. Ray looks over the advanced weapons blueprints, all of which are labeled OMAC. Um, also, Felicity requests some time off to go to go see Barry Allen in, in Central City. And finally, Nissa shows up at the club demanding to know, to know where Sarah is. Also, all flashbacks in the episode deal with Thea's training, or departure from Strong City and her training under Merlin. All right. Moving on to The Flash. Uh, last week's episode, uh, a local mob family is killed by what appears to be a sentient gas cloud. Joe and Barry begin to pour over the evidence on his mom's murder and are then called upon to investigate the aforementioned mob killing. Dr. Wells and Cisco suggest using the remains of the particle accelerator as a metahuman prison, uh, which is not entirely a terrible idea. Um, there's a flashback to the 90-day accelerator accident from, Star, from the POV of the Star Labs technicians. Um, and we meet Ronnie Raymond, who it, who's Caitlin's boyfriend, or fiancé. And we see him, over the course of the episode, we see him sacrifice himself to stop the particle accelerator from exploding. Uh, Barry and Caitlin examine the poison gas, which shows no gas residue, but rather DNA. Uh, not a human attack... The sentient gas cloud attacks a judge at the mall. Barry goes to investigate, tracks down the perp, but almost gets himself killed. The sample is taken to the Star Labs while Joe goes over the judge's old cases and gives Barry a talk about not being able to save everyone. Iris and Eddie discuss their relationship and kiss at the station. Caitlin and Barry discuss her dead fiance, Ronnie, and his mother before venturing into the accelerator ring. Uh, the killer's identity is discovered as is his next target, Joe. Barry saves Joe, but is almost seen by at Iron Heights, but is almost seen by his father. Uh, he actually is a little speedster trick of vibrating himself rather quickly to obscure his face, and then does what he can to stop the killer, who is, who ends up incarcerated in the remains of the particle accelerator. Eddie and Iris tell Joe that they're dating. However, Joe already knew, as he's you know a detective. But, and of course, he's not entirely that happy about it, but he deals with it. Um, also, uh, we find out at the we see at the end of the episode that Caitlin has somewhat recovered from the death of her fiancé. In a flash, further flashback, well, Dr. Wells views Barry's lightning strike by a camera, a camera hidden in Barry's lab, and apparently already knows Barry's name, in fact, saying 
See you soon, Barry Allen. Um, now, some theories about Wells. Well, theory, I guess. He's someone from the future, possibly Aobard Thawne, aka Reverse Flash Professor Zoom, aiming to somehow groom Barry for something. Uh, coming role in the coming crisis, uh, becoming the hero he's meant to be, so on and so forth, or that he will become, so on and so forth. We'll just have to see for now. Now, moving on to this week's episode of The Flash. Barry works on, on multitasking on his day off when an armored car gets hit by a gang and the truck driver gets back. When Barry shows up and foils the robbery, um, the driver of the armored car gets shot. Also, the leader of the, of the gang takes his mask off and Barry manages to see his face. Um, later on, Barry identifies him as one Leonard Snart, the son of a cop and uh, a frequent uh, suspect in various heists. Snart, cut to Snart's hideout where he explains some of his rules to his gang and kills the one who shot the armored car driver for losing his cool during the robbery. It turns out that the target of the robbery was, in fact, a diamond from the country of Kandak, um, which could possibly important, be important in the future. Felicity comes to visit Barry, and he shows off a bit for her uh, this, with his abilities and what all. Uh, then takes her to Star Labs to further show off and, you know, talk to the team some more. Turns out that uh, Dr. Wells is fully aware of who she is, at least at least professionally speaking, but not so much as who she is when it comes to Team Arrow. Joe and Eddie stake out the diamonds Snart tried to steal, while Snart picks up a uh, what is best described as an ice gun from Star Labs. He uh, also kills his weapon supplier. Amongst the other weapons shown is, was a, a heat, was basically a, a miniature flamethrower, which will come into play later. It will, trust me. Uh, Snart makes a move, cases the museum, makes a move elsewhere and to test out his, his cold gun, hits Flash with it, and he said it does <laughs> kind of work, but he and then he makes his plans to hit the museum. Hmm. Barry goes after Snart at the train station after Snart manages to steal the diamond, um, and Snart makes Barry choose between either saving the passengers on the train or stopping him by firing his the cold gun at the bottom of the train. Um, also, he manages to freeze Barry in a place get and. However, he is then falsely intimidated by Cisco. He also calls him by the name that he's picked out for him, the name that Cisco's picked out for him, Captain Cold, who's carrying what is in all actuality the Star Labs vacuum with some LEDs put on it. Snart, Snart leaves with the cold gun and the diamond, and also managed to figure out how it was that Star Labs was able to track the cold gun and removes it. Uh, Felicity heads back to Starling and has a chat with Barry on the train back, as well as a parting kiss. Um, and Snart, at the end, passes on an old, the flame gun, the miniature flamethrower he picked up, to an old partner of his named Mick. And yes. This is foreshadowing for that is foreshadowing for next week's episode. And Mick is an important is equally important. Alright, moving on to Gotham. Last week's episode. Uh, Bruce is trying to understand is how is that Gotham works. Uh, Penguin over here is Maroney's plan to hit a Falcon casino. Uh, also, a street musician is given a vial of a green liquid and inhales it before stealing a corner shop's ATM by hand. Falc also, he he goes through quite a supply of milk, we find out. Falcone meets with some of his associates about Maroni, with Penguin keeping an ear off. Gordon and Bullock find the musician after interrogating the uh, corner shop owner. And he is going through withdrawals, and then apparently dies on them after his after the ATM falls on him. Uh, the drug is handed out all over town. The press start calling the drug Viper. 
but this drug seems to apparently fascinate uh, Edward Nigma, our CSI. Uh, Maroney and Penguin have a chat about the casino. Penguin then tells Maroney some about his past, which does not entirely amuse Maroney, namely the fact that Penguin used to work for Falcone. The lawyer for a Wayne subsidiary comes to the police and names the man responsible for making Viper, basically trying to keep all the keep links to it quiet. Um, one of Maroney's men picks up Gordon to confirm Penguin's story, which, of course, he does. Fish further trains her secret weapon. Uh, Gordon and Bulk look into the dealer's past. Viper is apparently the first batch, which was not entirely successful, whereas the second batch has already been brewed and has its own name. Venom. Uh, the target of the dealer's statement, which is what he's attempting to do with the drug, is a char the charity fun function being held by Wayne Enterprises, which Bruce is at. Gordon is told to check Warehouse 39, which is empty, and Falcone then meets Fish's secret weapon. Also, Bruce manages to uh, replace follow the money with Wayne, Inter with Wayne Enterprises and, of course, Albert's help. Learns quite a bit about how things work within the company he is he will be inheriting. Um, it's a good episode. Uh, the link to Venom was quite cool. Um, anyways, moving on to this week's episode. It turns out with a flashback, ten years ago, Bullock and his old partner going over, going after a serial killer, whom Bullock kills, so his partner get does get injured. Um, at the time, Bullock was apparently very much uh, uh, the kind of cop to be to do the right thing. He was very much like Gordon, trying to, in some ways, also, but in his own way, and being a hero. Um, in the present, uh, a girl is found in the same manner as the as uh, the killer that was killed ten years ago. While Gordon and Barber try to work things out, uh, Montoya and Allen from the from the major crime unit find a witness to the to the cobblepot shooting, quote unquote, that says flat out Gordon did it. Peggy goes to visit his mother, talking with her about his disappearance and his and whatnot, and. The autopsy of the girl reveals a detail that was kept secret ten years ago. Uh, that was a coin being sewn under the skin at the back, on the back of the neck. Uh, Bullock and Gordon talk to Bullock's old partner about this. You know, did he pass it along to anyone? Because, as, as mentioned, this was kept up, this was kept quiet to weed out all the all the loonies and. Whatnot, who would attempt to turn themselves in saying, I did it, I did it. Uh, Bullock and Gordon end up at the same location as the last murder ten years previous and sa save the girl and catch the killer. Uh, Selena slips into Wayne Manor and sees Bruce's notes and whatnot of how the city works. Bullock and Gordon ponder the circumstances of the new killer learning about the coin. About the coin that about the coin detail. Upon returning home, Gordon is arrested for killing Penguin while Bullock talks to the therapist of the first victim's father, who it turns out hypnotized both killers as quote unquote therapy for Gotham. Um, upon returning to the GCPD, Gordon is brought in and hand upon Bullock's return to the GCPD, Bullock Gordon is brought in hand handcuffs, swearing he didn't kill Cobblepot, which he didn't. Um, and then Bullock is then arrested for as an accessory, and just as things are going even worse, the Penguin himself walks in to the GCPD and introduces himself to all, which basically does let uh, both Gordon and Bullock off the hook with the cops, but the mob, not so much. But I'm. Sure, that will be that will come up later. All right, moving on to the just premiered Constantine. Uh, the episode opens with John getting shock therapy voluntarily, I might add, at Ravensclaw Asylum in England. He's been there for three months ever since a demon killed a little girl named Astra, who was nine-year-old daughter of a friend of his. 
During group therapy, John gets up and leaves, following us as he sees a spider. She then follows to a poisoned patient, or to a possessed patient. I don't know why I read poison. Who he he exercises the spirit from before opting to leave the asylum for good. Um, cut to Atlanta, Georgia. A woman named Liv is attacked only to escape and find John. Also, I might add that there was a... The possessed woman wrote on the wall Liv's name. And... Uh, basically pointing John in the right direction. While investigating the attack, John meets an angel who has been tasked with keeping an eye on him. Which seems like no small task for an angel. Um, a friend of Liv's is attacked and possessed. Well, killed, attacked, killed, and possessed. In that order. Liv is apparently spared due to Ch John's friend Chaz having carved the Eye of Horus on her door. The next morning, John tells Liv that her father tasked him to look after her. And they are briefly... Uh, Basically, the possessed friend drives a corner van into Liv's place of employment and obliterates what is, what is her desk. Um, while escape, while getting out of the way, the uh, John, Liv, and Chaz end up in a car accident. And after Chaz manages to get Liv out, he gets killed by a, uh, a, a wired goes through his chest. John and Liv hole up in her father's cabin, which is filled with where they learn the name of the demon that's after her and where and where it will potentially strike next. Also, no note, the cabin is filled with all manner of neat little Easter eggs, including the helm of Nabu, which is worn by DC's equivalent to Doctor Strange. John and Liv bait the demon out and succeed in summoning him. Uh, John defeats the demon by having an associate kill the power grid, thusly cutting some of his power. And John almost falters and, and lets the demon go as the demon is offered to let Astra, uh, let Astra's soul go to, go to heaven if he lets him go. But this is all a ruse. Liv sees through it and uh, the demon is defeated and sent back to hell. Uh, Liv ends up opting to leave and not get further involved. Also of, of note is the fact that it's revealed that Chaz, though he did seem to die by being run through by a power cable, is a bit harder to kill than that. So he will apparently be around with us for quite some time. Uh, for the first episode, i got to say... Uh, a strong start, great casting, and uh, I'm rather hoping that the Helm of Naboo will play a uh, part in, th in things to come. Alright, taking a brief step away from comics to Scorpion. Last week's episode, uh, Amanda is picked up by the military and asked to speak to Walter. Turns out to be an old associate and a radio, a radio hacker that the team doesn't get along with at all. Team discovers there are issues with the nuclear reactor software. Um, it puts the show. The show is put back in disaster of the week mode with the addition of team friction and uh, predictability mode kicks, kicks in and pretty much everything that can go wrong does that is fixed at the last minute and everything works out and they basically tell the radio hacker associate to piss off. It was really a low point episode. Uh, moving on to this week's episode. Uh, after, a, after a job, the team is ordered for psych evals in which the events of said job are related. Um, the team is the job went like this. The team has been hired to up the security of a uh, museum, which is going to have a famous painting shown at it. Walter tries to learn how to fake interest in art and fails miserably. However, he's able to figure out that the painting they're there to increase the security, to be the security for, is actually a fake. Um, Hetty Lang of the Los Angeles NCIS office, yes, that's right, from the NCIS LA series, uh, provides additional info on the painting and a potential suspect for the forgery is eventually found and apprehended. 
He then points the finger at a at his financier, um, and the team goes. It looks like a party being held by him, which of course they screw everything up monumentally. Uh, emails are found showing that the curators involved, that the curator, the, the curator is actually involved, and the team stops his car and it blows up. However, it, it turns out that the teams that the team. Uh, I actually did that on purpose by switching out the fake painting for the uh, real painting and then Walter gets the the real painting to the family that originally owned it and also the team is pa passes uh, their psyche vows mainly because of Walter's empathy towards the rest of them and the fact that re uh, with Walter they all seem to have a common purpose and a sense of family um, it was interesting to note that apparently uh, Scorpion and NCIS take place in the same universe, and I had to seriously wonder if that means we're going to start seeing crossovers between the sh three shows. Uh, part of me kind of hopes not, though. Um, I mean, the occasional NCIS, NCIS LA crossover, hey, that's cool, you know, that, that makes sense, but uh, they would kind of just be thrown in for the sake of why not. Now, an occasional guest appearance between shows, I can deal with that. There's no problem, but let's keep crossovers to a minimum. Uh, all right, moving moving on. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Last week's episode, uh, a group of guests at a wedding die in a manner similar to contact with the obelisk. Uh, we found out that, of course, Hydra is involved. Rainer returns to Sky's father to ask for the obelisk, and is, of course, refused. Uh... Rainer then discovers that Simmons, uh, Simmons uh, at uh, one of the Hydra's ba various bases, and has, and basically gets her cover blown. Well, while attempting to escape, Simmons is saved by the by the building's chief of security, Bobby Morse, who is actually an undercover operative uh, placed by Coulson. Uh, Sky confronts Coulson about the uh, the alien writing and goes at, after her father only to have missed him by not too much time, though he views her attempts to find him in the building. Um, it, was, it was really awesome seeing Mockingbird, finally. Uh, this was really just a lot of cat and mouse type stuff. Also, another plot point is that Reyna, Reyna is killed off. And uh, to clarify who Reyna was, uh, the first season she was known as Flowers. Moving on to this week's episode. Uh, General Talbot speaks in front, of the, in front of the UN when it's attacked by what appears to be S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, but in all actuality, Hydra. Uh, mercenaries hired by Hydra to further smear S.H.I.E.L.D.'s name. Trip and Sky check government chatter. Bobby Hunter, go, Bobby Hunter and May go to Okinawa. And Simmons goes over a hard drive she manages managed to steal from the Hydra base she was she was at. Ward's brother, a U.S. senator, proposes a multinational police force to rout out Shield. Um, Belgium's uh, U.N. representative claims he will not tolerate or he will not back such a thing, and basically seems to apply that any uh, Shield agent that needs that's looking for a, place, a safe place is welcome to come to Belgium. Uh, Sky, of course, goes to talk to Ward about his brother at Coulson's behest, and Ward warns her to stay away from him. Bobby talks to Hydra's demolitions expert about the weapons used in the attacks and gets made, leading to a bit of a firefight and some arguing between her and Hunter, as she is Hunter's ex wife. Coulson has a chat with Ward's brother who informs him that Ward can truly not be trusted and that any of the stories he told about the horrible things that were done to him as a child were outright lies. Ward's brother then agrees to back off on his proposal in exchange for Ward. Um, an opponent, uh, the, uh, the Belgian representative, uh, Turns out to be a Hydra operative. Uh, in fact, it runs in the family. His uh, 
the Shield Safe House in Belgium is made and the team that impersonated Shield agents at the beginning of the episode is run into by Bobby Hunter and May and taken down. However, while being transferred to uh, his brother, Ward manages to escape. And then at the very at the end of the episode, a man walk, walks into the tattoo parlor and fit, has a tattoo finished up. That tattoo is the alien writing. So we're in a bit of what does that mean? But hopefully we'll find out. Finally, moving on to Sleepy Hollow. Last week's episode, Katrina sends Ichabod a letter via Raven. The horseman asks Henry to make sure Katrina cannot use her witchcraft in, her, in the home they've set us, they, they had, they're set up in. To that end, Henry tries to find a past sin of Katrina's to, to use against her. And uh, he manages to find something alright. A friend and fellow clone over here in Ichabod is attacked and killed by what's known as the Weeping Lady. After the, uh, initially, this is thought to be just a simple weeping lady attack, um, as Ichabod had pre had earlier in the night spurned her, and basically kind of said, "Oh, I'm uh, I'm married." You know, hey, I, you're interested. That's cool, but I'm married. While researching the weeping lady at the library, Abby runs into, into Holly, and Ichabod receives Katrina's letter. Shortly thereafter, Abby is attacked by the weeping lady and saved by Holly, and and we also find in this scene that. Ichabod does not know the concept of CPR. When Holly tells Ichabod to give Abby mouth to mouth. Uh, the weeping lady is revealed to actually be Ichabod's former fiance. And yes, it was set upon the world by Harry. Or by Henry. I don't know why I said Harry. Abby and Ichabod enlist Holly's aid in saving Katrina from the weeping lady and get a crossbow with a specialized bolt. Doesn't do any good though. I'll just go ahead and say that now. They arrive at the hor at the hor Katrina and the Horsemen's just as the Horseman leaves, and they end up going to save Katrina, having a good idea of where she's at. Katrina and Abby work together to send Mary, Ichabod's former fiance, to peace. Ichabod gets well, the weeping lady goes after him to uh, stop Katrina and Abby, and Ichabod actually kind of gets slimed. It's rather it was rather amusing to watch. But still, Katrina and Abby succeed. It's revealed that Katrina was present, however, when Mary when Mary died. Um, somewhat sh shaking Ichabod's trust in her. Uh, the horseman attacks, however, puts that moment to attack, and Katrina implores him to spare Ichabod, as in fact he did just save her life. Uh, Jenny. Abby's sister shows up at, at Holly's place and suddenly rekindles the, something of a romance between the two. Uh, the funeral for Ichabod's friend is held at a local bar and Ichabod rum ruminates over recent revelations. And finally, Moloch dis disciplines Henry for almost getting Katrina killed as she plays an important role in his plans. Alright, episode 2, be, or episode 6, this week's, begins with Abby and Ichabod doing yoga. Briefly before hitting a bar so Ichabod can relax and run into sh and also so they can run into Sheriff Corbin's son, Joe. While responding to a call concerning concerning Joe, uh, Abby and Ichabod see a preacher and discover that it has killed Joe's, fr Joe's friends in a rather brutal manner. Uh, Henry and former Captain Irving discuss Irving's deal, and Henry tells Irving a way out. Kill someone else. Soul for a soul, so to speak. Research into what, 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 what the victims and what was seen points to the creature in question being a Wendigo, which they presume to be Joe, who has since left the hospital. While investigating Joe's apartment, they find that Joe was carrying out, or was going to find his, what it is he inherited from his father, and discover that it is, it, yes, Joe is the Wendigo. Holly and Abby show up to help and decide to try it, and they all decide to try to find a cure for Joe. Uh, Joe reveals how he came to become one, which was a letter, which was actually sent 
to him a few weeks ago by Henry. Um, Abby discovers that things could be rather dire if they don't quickly find a cure for Joe, as a Wendigo has four transformations before definitively becoming a Wendigo. Holly and Ichabod go to a See, speaks to the local Shawnee to potentially cure Joe. Uh, Henry picks up uh, an exchange is made by Henry, um, Joe, as well as uh, what it is he inherited from his father, which was a rather nasty poison made up of the most poisonous creatures, some of the most poisonous creatures in the world, combining their venoms after killing one another. Of course, Henry betrays Joe and triggers his transformation. Irving almost kills the man who crippled his daughter, whom he's imprisoned with, but and also informs Abby of what's going on. Uh, Ichabod and Holly return with a cure, but of course, Joe has already left and transformed. So Abby and Ichabod uh, decide to lure Joe out by cutting their hands, you know, the smell of blood. And they managed to succeed in doing so before, and they actually, like I said, they cure Joe and they, they inform him of what it is his dad was really up to. Joe asks Abby if to write a recommendation to him to for from Quantico, while Ichabod discovers video games, and he has a very amusing way of yelling at people over, oh, during multiplayer. That's for sure. Um. Henry manages to combine the creatures from the poison into a spider, which then crawls into Katrina, Katrina's mouth as she sleeps, ending the episode. Um, and that is what we got for for this uh, doubled up version of the weekly TV roundup. We'll be back uh, back on uh, Saturday with a video uh, mainly concerned, which well, we'll you'll see the uh, what it's about uh, come Saturday. Uh, of course, next Wednesday we will be back with the weekly TV roundup on a week, back to its weekly normal weekly schedule instead of this uh, bi-weekly version, which I really don't want it to do on a normal basis. Um, as always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter and or Facebook. Links to both are down below. Um, and of course, as always, it's Rock and Roll Spock signing off. Live long and rock hard.